The Little Prince. Written and illustrated by Antoine de Saint Exupery. Frenchman. It says on the back cover No story is more beloved by children and grown ups alike than this wise, enchanting fable. One day, the author reminisces when his plane was forced down the Sahara a thousand miles from help. He encountered a most extraordinarily small person. If you please, said the stranger, draw me a sheep. And thus begins the remarkable history of the little prince. The little prince lived alone on a tiny planet no larger than a house. He owned three volcanoes, two active and one extinct. He also owned a flower, unlike any flower in all the galaxy of great beauty and inordinate pride. It was this pride that ruined the serenity of the little prince's world and started him on the interplanetary travels that brought him to Earth where he learned, finally, from a fox, the secret of what is really important in life. There are a few stories that in some way, in some degree, change the world forever for the readers. And this is one. So, the Little Prince. Once when I was six years old... <laughs> Once when I was six years old, I saw a magnificent picture in a book called True Stories from Nature about a primeval forest. And it was a picture of a boa constrictor in the act of swallowing an animal. Here's a copy of the drawing. In the book it said boa constrictors swallow their prey whole without chewing it. After that, they're not able to move and they sleep through the six months that they need for digestion. I pondered deeply then over the adventures of the jungle, and after some work with a coloring pencil, I, with a colored pencil, I succeeded in making my first drawing. My number, my drawing number one. It looked like this. Right. The bow constrictor with an elephant in the inside of it. Right. So. I showed my masterpiece to the grown-ups, and I asked them whether the drawing frightened them. Uh, and they answered, frightened? Why should, we, why should anybody be frightened of a hat? My drawing was not a picture of a hat. It was a picture of a boa constrictor digesting an elephant. But since grown-ups were not able to understand it, I made another drawing. I drew the inside of the boa constrictor so that the grown-ups could see it clearly. They always need to have things explained. My... Drawing number two look like this. <clears throat> the grown-up's response this time was to advise me to lay aside my drawings of bow constrictors, whether from the inside or the outside, and devote myself instead to geography, history, arithmetic, and grammar. And that's why at the age of six, I gave up what might have been a magnificent career as a painter. I had become disheartened by the failure of my drawing number one and my drawing number two. Grown-ups never understand anything by themselves, and it is tiresome for children to always and forever be explaining things to them. So then I chose another profession, and I learned to pilot airplanes. I have flown a little over all parts of the world, and it is true that geography has been very useful to me. At a glance, I can distinguish China from Arizona. And if one gets lost in the night, such knowledge is valuable. In the course of this life, I have had a great many encounters with a great many people who have been concerned with matters of consequence. I have lived a great deal among grown-ups. I have seen them intimately, close at hand, and that hasn't much improved my opinion of them. Whenever I met one of them who seemed to me all clear-sighted, at all clear-sighted, I tried to experiment at showing him my drawing number one which I always kept. I would try to find out so if this was a person of true understanding. But whoever it was, he or she would always say, that's a hat. And then I would never talk to that person about bow constrictors or primeval forest or stars. I would bring myself down to his level. I would talk to him about bridge and golf and politics and neckties. And a grown-up would be greatly pleased to have met such a sensible man. So I lived my life alone, without anyone that I could really talk to, until I had an accident with my plane in the desert of Sahara six years ago. Something was broken in my engine, and as I had with me neither a mechanic nor any passengers, I set myself to attempt the difficult repairs all alone. 
It is a question of life or death for me. I had scarcely enough drinking water to last a week. The first night then I went to sleep on the sand a thousand miles from any human habitation. I was more isolated than a shipwrecked sailor on a raft in the middle of the ocean. Thus you can imagine my amazement at sunrise when I was awakened by an odd little voice. It said, if you please, draw me a sheep. What? Draw me a sheep. I jumped to my feet, completely thunderstruck. I blinked my eyes hard. I looked carefully all around me, and I saw a most extraordinarily small person who stood there examining me with great seriousness. Here you may see the best portrait that later I was able to make of him, but my drawing is certainly very much less charming than its model. That, however, is not my fault. The grown-ups discouraged me in my painter's career when I was six years old, and I never learned to draw anything except boas from the outside and boas from the inside. Now I stared at this sudden apparition with my eyes fairly starting out of my head in astonishment. Remember, I'd all crashed in the desert, Sahara Desert, a thousand miles from any inhabited region, and yet my little man seemed neither to be strained uncertain, uncertainly among the sands, nor to be fainting from fatigue or hunger or thirst or fear. Nothing about him gave any suggestion of a child lost in the middle of the desert a thousand miles from any human habitation. When at last I was able to speak, I said to him, but what are you doing here? In an answer, he repeated very slowly, as if he were speaking of a matter of great consequence. If you please, draw me a sheep. When a mystery is too overpowering, one dare not disobey. Absurd as it might seem to me, a thousand miles from any human habitation and in the danger of death, I took out my pocket, a sheet of paper, and my fountain pen. And then I remembered how my studies had been concentrated on geography, history, arithmetic, and grammar. And I told the little chap, a little crosser too, that I did not know how to draw. He answered me, that doesn't matter. Draw me a sheep. I had never drawn a sheep, so I drew for him one of the two pictures I had drawn so often. It was of the boa constrictor from the outside. And I was astonished to hear the little fellow greet it with, No, 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 I don't want an elephant inside a boa constrictor. A boa constrictor is a very dangerous creature, and an elephant is very cumbersome. Where I live, everything is very small, and what I need is a sheep. So, draw me a sheep. So then I made a drawing. He looked at it carefully, and he said, No, this sheep is very sickly. Make me another. So I made another drawing. My friend gently smiled gently and indulgently you see for yourself he said this is not a sheep it's a ram it has horns so i did my drawing over once more but it was rejected too just like the others this one is too old i want a sheep that will live a long time by this time my patience was exhausted because i was in a hurry to start taking my engine apart so i tossed off the drawing so here are the three drawings that sheep was um I don't know, there's something wrong with it. All these sheep, this one had the horns, and then this one was sickly. I think that one was too old. Alright. So, now the one on top was sickly, and the one on the bottom was old. So I tossed off the drawing, and I threw out an explanation with it. This is only a box. The sheep you asked for is on the inside. I was very surprised to see a light break over the face of my young judge. That is exactly the way I wanted it. Do you think that this sheep will have to have a great deal of grass? Why? Because where I live, everything is very small. There will surely be enough grass for him, I said. It's a very small sheep that I have given you. He bent his head over the drawing. Not so small that, look, he's gone to sleep. And that's how I made it the acquaintance of the little prince. It took me a long time to learn where he came from. The little prince who asked me so many questions never seemed to hear the ones I asked him. It was from words dropped by chance that little by little everything was revealed to me. The first time he saw my airplane, for instance, I shall not draw my airplane. That would be much too complicated for me. He asked me, what is that object? That is not an object. It flies. It's an airplane. It's my airplane. And I was proud to have him learn that I could fly. He cried. He cried out then. What? You dropped down from the sky? Yes, I answered modestly. Oh, that is funny. And the little prince broke into a lovely peal of laughter. 
which irritated me very much. I like my misfortunes to be taken seriously. Then he added, so you too come from the sky. Which is your planet? At that moment, I caught a gleam of light in the impenetrable mystery of his presence, and I demanded abruptly, do you come from another planet? But he did not reply. He tossed his head gently without taking his eyes from my plane. It is true that on that you can't have come from very far. And he sank into a reverie which lasted a long time. Then taking my sheep out of his pocket, he buried himself in the contemplation of his treasure. You can imagine how my curiosity was aroused by this half confidence about the other planets. I made a great effort therefore to find out more on this subject. My little man, where do you come from? What is this where I live of which you speak? Where do you want to take your sheep? After a reflective silence, he answered, The thing that is so good about the box that you have given me is that at night he can use it as his house. Yeah, that's so. And if you are good, I will give you a string too so you can tie him during the day and a post to tie him with. But the little prince seemed shocked by the offer. Tie him? What a queer idea. But if you don't tie him, I said, he will wander off somewhere and get lost. My friend broke into another peal of laughter. But where do you think that he would go? Anywhere, straight ahead of him. Then the little prince said earnestly, that doesn't matter. Where I live, everything is so small. And with perhaps a, a hint of sadness, he added, straight ahead of him, nobody can go very far. Here's the little prince. On asteroid B612. I had thus learned a second fact of great importance. This was the planet the little prince came from was scarcely any larger than a house. But that did not really surprise me much. I knew very well that in addition to the great planets such as the Earth, Jupiter, Mars, Venus, to which we have given names, there are also hundreds of others, some of which are so small that one has a hard time seeing them through the telescope. When an astronomer discovers one of these, he does not give it a name, but only a number. He might call it, for example, Asteroid 325. I have serious reason to believe that the planet from which the little prince came is the asteroid known, known as B612. This asteroid has only once been seen through the telescope, and that was by a Turkish astronomer in 1909. On making his discovery, the astronomer had presented to the International Astron Astronomical, Astronomical Congress in a great demonstration, but he was in a Turkish costume, so nobody would believe what he said. Grown-ups are like that. Fortunately, for the reputation of asteroid B612, a Turkish dictator made a law that his subjects, under the pain of death, should change to European costume. So in 1920, the astronomer gave his demonstration all over again, dressed with impressive style and elegance. And this time, everybody accepted his report. If I've told you these details about the asteroid and made a note of its number for you, it is on account of the grown-ups and their ways. Grown-ups love figures. Oh, here. There's a Turkish astronomer. He's looking through his telescope and he finds this asteroid B612, but he was in a Turkish costume. And then he's dressed in a European outfit. So grown-ups love figures. When you tell them that you've made a new friend, they never ask you any questions about the essential matters. They never say to you, well, what does his voice sound like? What games does he love best? Does he collect butterflies? Instead, they demand, how old is he? How many brothers has he? How much does he weigh? How much money does his father make? Only from these figures do they think that they have learned anything about him. If you were to say to the grown-ups, I saw a beautiful house made of rosy brick with geraniums in the windows and doves on the roof, they would not be able to get any idea of that house at all. You would have to say to them, I saw a house that cost $20,000. Then they would ex exclaim, oh, what a pretty house that is, since you told them the cost. 
Just so you might say to him, the proof that the little prince existed is that he was charming.